Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Bokuga, 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 Bokuga. That sounded just like the song. Welcome to the Visual K podcast. I'm your host Frederick, also known as Whirling Black, and with me today I have the usual suspects. Your co-host Alexi. Your sexual beast, Aaron. <laughs> Very good. Um, I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> My sexual beast, James. <laughs> oh. Translation of Honme. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be my sexual beast this Valentine? <laughs> nice. Oh, I get it. Double reference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sick. As you no doubt have figured out from these uh, amazing references, today we are talking about the uh, um, very popular Visual K band Disperse Ray and their sort of very earliest period from their foundation up until and including the EP Sexual Beast in 2002. So we're covering about two and a half, two years about of material today. Uh, guys, how do you feel about Disperse Ray? Do you have any connection to them at all? Or do, are you going in blind? Hint, hint. I love them. Um, I, I heard them. I found, I think the first time I found Disperse Ray, I was on a uh, one of those rare English VK sites. And they had like images of like artists that were on Omnibus, like VA CDs. And one of them was Despair's Ray with the cool like spider web backdrop and hot, super high contrast. And I was like, damn, they look rad as hell. And so <laughs> I had to look them up and I think I found Sexual Beast. Oh, it's not a bad place to start, I would say. Not a bad place to start. What about you, Alexi? Despair's Ray actually has the distinction of being my first Visual K band. Uh, I found them on a Finnish video game website and someone had just linked Garnet. Someone just made a thread for Japanese music and Garnet was linked there. I clicked on it and actually I've loved Visual K ever since. Like genuinely it was, didn't take more than 10 seconds for me to just look at the aesthetic and the music and that was it. Yeah, and uh, uh, James, what's your relation with Disperse Ray? Um, I've heard of Disperse Ray. You've heard of Disperse Ray? Yeah, I've heard of <laughs> I've heard of Disperse Ray. Uh, I didn't have time to listen to anything, so we'll see how useful I am for this episode. <laughs> I have to say as well, uh, Disperse Ray was one of my earliest bands I got into, and I feel like they are a very good sort of marker on how long someone has been a VK fan. Like Visual K fans from before 2010 will most likely be very familiar with them because they were one of the biggest bands in the overseas fandom. But I think the younger generations, the people who became VK fans after they disbanded, like people who joined about 2012 and forward, I would say they probably, a lot of them don't have any relation to Disperse Ray at all. So. Like, I remember I was playing Garnet at the club once and like uh, someone who was like 18, 19 walked up to me and like, this sounds cool, what band is this? And I'm like, this would be unthinkable, uh, like, <laughs> in 10 years ago or uh, <laughs> before that. I mean, that, you know, everyone knew Despair Strave, they were like one of the biggest bands. Yep, that's true. Everyone knew of them up to a certain point. I like that we can be surprised about something, that someone doesn't remember what happened 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but it's just a very interesting sort of like uh, way to tell how long someone has been a fan, I suppose. Because a lot of the other bands that were popular in those days are still, you know, popular, like Deer and Grey and Mook and all of those still have running fan bases. But Disperse Ray sort of like just took a plummet off the cliff and no one listens to them anymore. I will say I've probably heard Disperse Ray. Like I I've known that name like forever like it was one of the most popular ones like way back when <laughs> uh so basically what we have here is like three people who have listened to disperse ray for a very long time and one who might have heard a song at some point in his life yeah that's about right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's a that's a good balance i would say yeah, and I think they're very interesting because they're one of those bands that went for this dark gothic style of VK without going for all of the VK tropes as much as a lot of the other bands. I lumped them in together with bands like Anmude, for example. 
more like the Western goth sound. For sure, yeah. I mean, even among the bands that were out at the time, they stood out. I'd say less and less throughout their career they stood out, but that this early period actually that we're talking about today is like, there's nothing else like it, in my opinion. They are interesting specifically for the fact that you cannot lump them into a crowd or a scene. We kind of make this a geographical distinction or like, hey, those bands were their mates, etc. And as we're going to find out during this region, the, <laughs> during this region, during this episode, they were playing anywhere and everywhere with anyone who was just available to show up. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, they didn't just tour with their friends. No. I guess we could lead that into a bio of sorts. They formed in 1999. What they? Oh, they never changed lineup, which I thought was interesting. Uh, yeah. That's, that's rare in VK, relatively rare. And it usually kind of happens when a band's sound and concept comes together perfectly and everyone matches up stylistically. It's a pretty good example of a band that sort of like they were all on the same page. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also interesting that they formed as early as they did because when I listen to like their sort of like contemporaries from the same time, I feel like they were very strange in Visual K and that they found more contemporaries who sounded similarly like a couple of years in, like in the mid 2000s. Yeah. And they transitioned pretty quickly, too, because their early stuff was actually closer to like what was around in the scene at the time. The early, 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 like the demos. They, they really like they jumped ship from that immediately. Thank, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to get right into the demos or? Well, let's see. Uh, I guess um, we'll, we'll probably disappoint some people if we don't mention their previous bands. I remember that happened with uh, Gazette. Oh, right. Yes. So the only member who didn't have a background in VK that we know of is Zero, right? Zero. Right. The bassist was Zero. Uh, vocalist Hizumi and drummer Tsukasa were in a band called La Vale. Yeah. And guitarist Karyu was in Dear Mind. And they were all like Kotake style bands, very much in that style sounded like a million other bands around at the time. Personally, I actually liked LaVale the most. They had a song called Snow Feathers that I like. It's just sappy. It sounds like like La Miss Fairy and a million other bands, but it's great. Yeah, I like their stuff as well. Uh, I think it helps that it's Hisumi singing as well because he has a very nice voice. True. Uh, Dear Mind, I'm not even sure if I've ever listened to, to be honest, so I can't comment on them. <laughs> Dear Mind? Dear mind, D D I E U R. Oh, okay. Dear mind. Dear mind. I thought it was like D E E R mind, and I was like, "Wow, that's a cool name." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dear mind. <laughs> uh, uh, sadly, not known. Uh, <laughs> that'd be a much cooler name. But yeah, that's 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 pretty much their bio, right? I mean, do you want to pre prelude anything else? Yeah, I think that it shows that they started out in Disperse Ray quite early. Like, they didn't have a long career going into it before starting Disperse Ray. So in that sense, I guess they were a bit like uh, Gazette. They didn't have an established popular career before they started the band. Not like Deer and Grey, for example, who were already popular in Las Hades and stuff like that. Well, if Deer and Mind would have taken off, they could have formed Deer Space Ray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is where the one hour laughing track goes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we thought we needed a laughing track for this episode. So I was looking for like free ones. And the first one I found was like one hour long. So we we're thinking, like, yeah, let's just drop that in the episode. <laughs> I don't think I've ever laughed that long in my life. <laughs> I sure hope people, not. <laughs> I hope they got paid. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think talking about your mind is actually a pretty fitting uh, way to work ourselves into the first demo because their first demo is actually supposedly a leftover track from Dear Mind. Uh, so we could go right into that one, which is Ao from 1999. Ow. 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 Is this just really quiet? <laughs> yeah, the quality <laughs> is uh, amazing. Yeah, it's the epitome of a demo. I mean, it's like it sounds like a sixth generation cassette tape. Uh, I think actually this demo was recorded with a microphone in the rehearsal studio. That's why it sounds <laughs> was like it the this. same one I used for the Disorder episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it might be. So this track is just strange in the Disperse Ray discography. It really doesn't fit in anywhere with the rest of the tracks, which is why I think this uh, rumor, how should I say, started that it's a leftover from the previous band, because it does sound very like 90s quota, which the their previous bands were. I mean, I think it's completely understandable and forgivable that they have a dime a dozen VK track because they literally just crawl out of their basement. <laughs> yeah. so it's not like it's a senior band with 15 full lengths under their belt. Like they just probably yeah. were putting out every single song that they could actually compose together and find the time to play it. Yeah, it's like a perfect peek into their Code Decay beginnings. They're like babies, fresh fresh from the VK womb. I think they actually gave this away at their first sponsored live and they had like pressure from what I heard. This is just, you know, things I heard over 20 years of uh, vague rumors, but that they had uh, a pressure to get something together to record, uh, to hand out as their first demo for their first sponsored live in uh, December of 99. So they basically went like, well, uh, you know, uh, Karu has this leftover track, I guess we can, you know, record that one, it's low effort. Uh, so they put it together quite quickly. I think they did 20 copies, I actually own one of them. I, uh, I bought it on uh, auction, a bit of the band disbanded. Uh, it used to go for 68,000 yen and I bought it for 9,800, so pretty good deal. Good deal. Really Maybe good you deal. you can tell it's by the guitarist because the last third is a gigantic ass solo. <laughs> <laughs> A huge solo. Does it fade out, though? Oh, I question. don't remember. <laughs> that would be a guitarist power move. <laughs> That's true. Have you a VK check? move? Uh, yeah, check. Yeah, check if there's a fade out. Yeah, he's going off. He's going no, off. They Oh, just, it doesn't. It just goes out. The drummer does the... Feedback. I send it home. It's a feedback outro. Oh, that's cool, actually, though. I like that ending. Yeah. Yeah, but he's basically Van Halen in the last third of that track. It's fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this tape came with one more song, which is System. But the thing with this version of System uh, on this tape is that it doesn't have the synths, which I think kind of define this song. So it's kind of like listening yeah. to half a song. So I don't really enjoy this version. Yeah. So Yeah, there's not much to say about it because it's like almost like it's a, an almost complete version of the same exact song. They really don't change much except there's a missing layer. Yeah, I imagine, you know, since it's a recording of them in the rehearsal studio, I suppose, and they couldn't, they maybe they couldn't afford adding the synth playback on top of it or something like that. I'm actually fascinated that there is even a synthless version of it. Like, it, it leaves such a void there that's supposed to be filled by something. Yeah, maybe they played it live. Yeah, most likely. So I think that's really all I have to say on the first demo. It really was just the first attempt to get something out, and it really isn't that representative of the band as a whole. So yeah. I think we can just move on now that we have acknowledged it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's discuss the last two demo tapes, uh, Sakura and Razor. So this song and uh, another demo came out around the same time. Uh, Razor and Sakura were the two that came out after that first demo. And they feel a little more thrashy. That, almost like there's, it's kind of like a transition period between the Kotike and their, their, the sound that people would know them for. And I like them. I really like Sakura and Razor as songs. I feel like that sort of transition to the goth metal sound is interesting. Uh, I think it's something in, I keep in mind that I feel like Racer is a song they wrote for a very specific reason, and it's for the stage rush. Oh, yeah. uh, back in the day, they this was one of those tracks that every band had to have, as you have heard many times in this pod. You know, there had to be a song you could drag out for ten minutes and just repeat sections over and over and over, where you could just like have full on aggression. Yeah, and I think this sort of like vaguely thrashy number racer with a shouting works really well for that yes sakura i 
think, however, is a song that, at least to me, it feels like the band forgot it as fast as they made it. As far <laughs> as I can find out, it was only played once live at the show where it was distributed, the demo tape. Wow. So that's not like a ringing endorsement when the song is only played at the concert where it's handed out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but otherwise... It oh, was just thrown away. Yeah, other than that, I think it's a decent track. I have... I really, I mean, out of the two of them, I prefer Racer, but neither are songs I put on and listen to as, you know, enjoy enjoyable material. I would suggest uh, an, like a new listener who wants to go through the Disperse Ray discography to just start with the first single and go back to the demos later if they want context, because this is not the place to start, I would say. I could live without these tracks, to be honest. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it is, I will say that it, it's actually commendable that aside from that very first song, they never did that sort of sweet, melancholy, melody bullshit that most of the bands were known for. From this point forward, it was just dark, all the way through until some tracks on call set, maybe. Uh, a lot of shouty English. It's kind of cute that they were trying to trashy thing, actually. And again, you can tell that they're young. They're sort of looking around, but other people are doing a little bit and trying things out. Um, it's only a curiosity for the historians. Yeah, basically, I would say that as well. I think that's a great way to sum it up. And uh, Razor was actually released just less than one month before their first single so it was very close to you know a proper cd release because racer was from september of 2000 and uh, their first single kumo is from october so let's get into that one So Kumo opens up with what is to this day actually my favorite Desperate song ever. Damn. A song called Kisei Parasite. Yeah, I know. It's my favorite still to this day. Wow. Composed by Tsukasa, the drummer, which I think is cool. I love drummer composers. Oh, I didn't actually know that. That's uh, that's very interesting. Oh, yeah. You... Tsukasa did that song. I mean, I own the single. I should have checked that, but, you know. Um... Is that the guy who went to Microhead 4 ends? Yes. Yeah. And he's also... Tsukasa also is an Enka singer. Right, yes. He's like a VK Enka singer. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that is true. He does that as well. It's an interesting career trajectory for sure. It is. He's He might be the only VK Enka singer. Yeah, possibly. I'm not going to uh, try to... Wait, no. The guy from D out, Dauto. Oh, didn't the... I think... Didn't the Art Cube guy also go Enka? He did some solo There's probably thing. a couple. Oh, okay. Although what unites them all is that none of them are successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tsukasa is successful me. by personality alone. Yeah, but but I have to say that, you know, the intro of Kisei Parasite it just sets the mood for this single so well. Like, you know, the wind and the creaking door and all that. It's just, yeah. yeah. It's just such a... I mean, it's that's so actually when we're talking about them not having a lot of, like, VK tropes. I think, you know, this is one instance where they actually just went full in for a VK trope, but it really works. Yeah, the music itself is different, but the atmosphere is still there, of that sort of, like, brooding, gothic visual style. You know, I would say that there are tropes, but they're so committed to the darkness of the music. And it's really from this point forward. It's so oppressive and so dark. Um... The guitar tone is super rough, and there's actually some really kind of cool guitar tones uh, in their early stuff in general. There is also, I guess, their first, um, their synthesizer makes a debut, and it's a very good one. You think, especially on the first track. Yeah. Yeah. Right out the gate, they, they sound kind of like nothing out in VK at the time, especially. There's similarities. There's, I mean, yeah, like... There's similarities and stuff. Like, and if you write it out on paper, you'd have a hard time convincing someone that Despair's Ray <laughs> sounded so unique. But you really kind of have to hear it once you hear the songs, like on Kumo. It's yeah, it, it 
It's really unique. It has this really like sort of like spare slow-fi feeling to the synths. Like they're mm -hmm. definitely not the overly flourishing VK synths you're used to. I believe in our circles we have jokingly called it the Burzum synth <laughs> because it has these long droning notes where it goes like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah. And it's unique. It's not used too much. You kind of almost wish that the sort of tapestry synth would be used more in this sort of very stripped down type of way. Yeah, it definitely doesn't lead any of the tracks. It's just adding some flavor. Mm -hmm. And there's that perfect storm with Karyu's heavy metal guitars and Hizumi's aggressive deep tone, his almost baritone. Yeah. And it sounds a bit like, uh, they, they, they kind of sound at this point like if the guys from Testament did a collab with Typo Negative and someone made like a Nightcore remix of it. <laughs> wow. You know what I mean? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I I don't know, but it sounds cool. All right. Well, give those three things a listen. No, <laughs> give those two things a listen and then make a Nightcore remix of one of them. Aaron, could you define Nightcore? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> <laughs> Nightcore is literally just if you take a song and speed it up by like two times or like one time. So and that's nightcore. That's so all basically, what you do is that you play both of those bands at the same time, and then you put like a Yohi Lloyd fucking yeah. nightcore remix on, and all three simultaneously, you got <laughs> the first Desperate Race single. Of. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. Um, I'm not super committed to that comparison, but I think we should just stick with that. Yeah. We'll open the show with it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and also one more thing that goes through all of these songs is that Hisumi's singing is really on point. It really sounds like this, you know, it has this weird guy doing weird things in a basement feeling to it. Well, that might actually be the most unique thing about this in general. This is actually where he really finds his voice. Um, doesn't really have a lot of points of comparison in VK. This is the most VK release out of their like official releases, so to speak. Uh, but there is already that Western influence creeping in. Yeah, I was just going to say, these guys were only in their mid-20s when this came out, and it's still it's it's more polished and complete than any band can hope for. I mean, after years of development, there's bands who never reached this level, and these guys reached this level on their first CD. It's crazy. Yeah, and there's, like Alexis said, there's some old-school stuff creeping in. Like, in the second track, there's some old-school VK arpeggios that make an appearance, and it also is the start, possibly, of the Hisumi trademark Angry Cat screams, which you will hear a lot more uh, coming up. <laughs> yeah, I love the cat screams. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and the third track, which is... Uh, well, it's actually called Mishitsu no Naka Ikareta Kimi no Senritsu, which, you know, it actually references a Mishitsu. I just call it Ikareta Kimi. Yes, me too. But it references a Mishitsu, so... But, oh man, that, that shriek at the end of Ikareta Kimi is so great. It sounds like a banshee in the forest somewhere. Yeah. It's a very... Izumi, I, I, I'm betting it's Izumi. <laughs> it's a very it's uh, ambitious track as well, almost six minutes long. And it also has the... Mm -hmm. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, which appears, which is, you know, yeah. we have the... That's a staple. Yeah. So like you said, it's a, there's a lot of VK staples in this one, uh, mm. which is nice. And I will say that uh, even though their sound has developed at this point, I feel like Razor or Sakura actually would have fit in on this. If they kind of redid them a little bit, they would be a perfect fit. Yeah. So right after this uh, single, they actually participated on an omnibus uh, album called Hysteric Media Zone, which was uh, together with such illustrious acts as Guillotine, Cure, Skull, Sigma, Crystal Eyes, and Crescien de Rona. Mm -hmm. God uh, damn. Great <laughs> Did any of those go to the Tokyo Dome? <laughs> uh, uh, on all of which, besides the Sparse Ray, made the great career move of disbanding by the following year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> they were probably on to something. <laughs> yeah, so this uh, Omnibus actually is uh, like a long series, so I'm sure we will touch on more parts of it. I think there's like seven or eight parts, but this was the first one. And, you know, all of the other bands were nobodies, went nowhere, but... <laughs> <laughs> there must have been a good sell for the, the next rendition of this VA. <laughs> it's like, hey guys, we want to be on this VA. <laughs> None of these bands survived. <laughs> but trust me, bro. It's a graveyard. <laughs> It's gonna work out this time. I guess the good point on, you know, the Sparse Ray making it at least. Yeah, at least you could point out to something. It's like Russian Roulette, but it's like just one spot without the bullet. <laughs> Dude, actually, Hysteric Media Zone CDs are actually very much like that. It's like a 
12 bands go in one band comes out kind of thing <laughs> yeah that's kind of the fate of a lot of omnibus bands though like you have like one yeah. that makes it and a lot of them that just fades out but yeah my what i wanted to get to was that there's a great re-recording of uh, system from the first demo on this one which is the definitive version i would say it has the synths and everything really nice yeah uh, and it also has a uh, original song called Loop Divide Neo Abomination, which is another Rush song, which was also used for that purpose uh, in the first year or so. But it got phased out a lot earlier than Racer, and it's not really yeah. a remarkable song to me. It's one of the few songs from that era that I forget almost as soon as yeah, I listen to it. Same. I, I think at this point it's probably good to start talking more about the influence which they received from Western industrial metal. Because when you think of this time, 2000, it, a lot of the stuff that's going on in the West probably all arrived to Japan with like a slight delay. So from foreign acts, we could even think of something as prosaic as like Rob Zombie's 98 album, Hellbilly Deluxe, which I'm sure people who were into that style had heard. Uh, then we, uh, it's, it's not just a synthesizer alone, but it's that heavy, jagged riffing style, which they had. And then in the late 90s, you could ministry and skinny puppy already as completely established acts but i think most importantly both aesthetically and musically for this person and some people might disagree on this but it's probably marilyn manson who was very famous already in the u.s and also in japan drawing pretty big houses yeah when he was coming there yeah there's no doubt that he had an influence for sure i agree with all those actually and even maybe some as far back as like bauhaus for all the atmosphere um Bauhaus have a lot of songs that sound like Despair's Ray when they're kind of like dialed back. Yeah, I think a lot of that stuff distills through the Visual K sort of gene pool, if you could call it that. And actually, speaking of VK, uh, there was an interest in goth, but it wasn't huge. And I, I mean like the industrial one and not the post-punk variety. So around this time you get, I guess, early Velvet Eden sort of kind of touching that sort of ballpark. Uh, Malice Miser's third album just right around the corner and that was like a total commitment into that style and then some very strange pioneers like dying crisis eccentric nothingness to revolution then bucktick cyberpunk period i guess uh but the amount of contemporaries doing the same thing that despis ray was doing when they started out was super slim although karyu insists in multiple interviews that he doesn't listen to japanese music like he doesn't listen to the other bands that he's around right now he right now being the early 2000s he was like i listen to western bands that's literally oh. the almost the exclusively same tier of stuff like yeah this is the band that's gonna make it but if it doesn't i'm gonna quit music forever i'm just gonna go work in the 7-eleven <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> but in desperate yeah. case i can kind of believe that if they became completely autonomous fairly early on and then, then started looking into stuff like lauren seal by their redeemer era singles but this time period between that, I feel like their eyes eyes were totally on their own thing and what was happening in the West. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning going now into the next single and the next year, which is 2001, is that their fame must have escalated quite quickly because by the time the Genwaku single was released in March, no, uh, sorry, April of 2001, the single was so popular that the first press 1000 copies were sold out already in pre-orders, so a second press was released the very same day in a different case. So it's a bit unusual that the first press and the second press release on the same day. I don't think I've heard of other examples of that. Pretty impressive for this early. So yeah, uh, play a sample from the first song on the Genwaku single and then we get rolling. Does that count as rapping? Mm. No, no. Do they qualify as an adult no, band? No? no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's adolescent at best. Uh, Shame. 14. <laughs> uh. I yeah. <laughs> I think the single is more of the same in the sense that it kind of continues the sound of the first single, maybe facing yeah. out a bit of the 90s VK tropes, but it still has very much mm -hmm. the same energy going for it. 
I mean, yep, it's a good I think the up. first track is definitely the star of the single. The third track is, in my opinion, one of the weakest of this era. I'm not a big fan of Genkaku, mm-hmm. which is track number three. I would agree. Genkaku is probably the weakest. I like when he goes, Kimi no maboroshi! And then it doubles down to like double time. That's a cool, cool part. But other than that, the rest of the song is pretty, you know, it's decent. My favorite actually is Gensho. It's like kind of slower. It's a slower tempo. I think it might be their first kind of like low tempo song at this point. Uh, uh, it has like a dark atmosphere. It's kind of like their 304 Goshitsu uh, at that the point. Track two? Yeah, I think it's um, oh, track yeah. two. Uh, and I mean, to me, it's kind of like their sort of most... It's dispersed right at their most Anmure, kind of, is my mm-hmm. note on yeah. the track. That is a very sort of... It's, it's a soft it, and more straight up golf number in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. It does sound more like Amure. It's got like a steady rhythm. The drums are kind of like, almost like a loop. It's great. But yeah, other than that, it's pretty much like a continuation. It's like a part two of uh, Kumo. Uh, Alexi, do you have any takes on this single? This one is just a little bit tighter than the last one. <laughs> that, that, that's it. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, it's about uh, right. I, I think I see what you mean. It's... Uh, it's a very nice single, but it doesn't really provide a lot of new things. It just sort of like mm-hmm. polishes up a bit. and That's why track two is my favorite, because it kind of gives something new, I guess. Um, yeah, which is, you know, I think that's... Yeah, what? Sorry? Oh, no, I was just... I had something to say after you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you don't have to stop in, in the middle. Of the this is when I'm James interrupting you. Shut the everyone. fuck up. Shut up. Just okay, shut up. James, you go ahead. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Give the audience what they want. Yes. <laughs> they want. Do the line. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like Kagra. Yeah. This show would be better in video, I swear. Nothing can improve this show. <laughs> if you keep that part in, for people listening, we kind of raise our hands when we have something to say. But that time, James did it, and Frederick thought he was interrupting him. So he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Didn't really. James yeah, was basically I, I fucking Kanye me. Westing himself in front of. <laughs> the, <laughs> Taylor I'm Swift. Um, what is with the stylization of the titles? It's like uh, all the tracks are two kanji. I know. And uh, right in the middle of them, they put like the romaji. Yeah. <laughs> like I feel like they were all about gen waku gen gen waku waku. Yeah. Gen yes. gen, gen waku waku. It's like ATM <laughs> it's, machine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we did have an interaction with the man on Twitter. Yeah, the Twitter. Oh, yeah, that's actually relevant. Um, they seemed to be really into uh, typefacing uh, stylization because um, I posted on Twitter about um, why Despair's Ray during this period had the little two, two little pluses at the end and uh, then quickly abandoned the pluses. And I just tweeted about it. And someone on Twitter was like, you should at Hizumi. He's on Twitter. This is uh I'm gonna I'm gonna give them credit. This is at crimson underscore bitch. They told me you should add Hizumi. Thanks to that person. Cause I did it. I added Hizumi and I asked the question. And immediately, like minutes later, he replied and pretty much uh they were only ever meant to be a graphical flourish and not the official name. The official name was always Despair's Ray without the pluses. So it wasn't plus Despair's Ray plus? <laughs> it was never plus Despair's Ray plus. Oh. It was I thought it was supposed to be cross I wonder if you can tag all the guys on Historic Media Zone 1 and they will reply just as fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. Honestly, I'm, I love, that's one of the things I love about Twitter is like the quick communication with people like this. I'm going to do that more often for the episodes. But yeah, uh, James actually, um, that's a good point. Uh, Hizumi said they were crosses. Oh, which okay. is a little cooler, a little more visual, okay? Even though he used pluses, or they used pluses, he in his reply, he used the emoji for the cross. Yeah, so they yeah I guess the up. cross emoji didn't really exist uh, back then in the early 2000s. Although, <laughs> if it not. had and they would have used it, it would have been pretty cool. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they just like wild kind of stylizations of, of text. Um, yeah, I think they're just trying to be cool. Which they were kind of successful. Yeah, no, it looks cool. Yeah. Gen Gen Waku Waku, official title. <laughs> like plus the spares, right? Plus apostrophe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Plus D apostrophe S spares, right? Plus. Yes. 
As fair as Ray. Uh, anyway, so I think that, uh, you know, after Genwaku and the sort of like breakout success that single was, it made sense for them to try to make something bigger and more ambitious. And just a couple of months later, actually, they managed to put out their first EP, which is called Terrors. So let's take it away with the first track. Uh, I'd say play second track <laughs> and will imply the first track. What? Okay, so the first track, Fascism, opens up with something we don't want in a podcast. Unless we're doing historical fiction. Okay. <laughs> So the reason we sampled track two instead of track one on this one is uh, Quite simply, because track number one starts out with, not sampled, mind you, it's a original recording of what I assume is the band shouting a very particular uh, Nazi slogan and some like marching band music in the background. Uh, so I think this track might have put some Western fans off. I mean, I actually thought that was a sample all this time. It makes it a little worse. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's no, no, original. no, it's original. It's but, original content. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 like yeah, that was the intro, and I remember that intro turning off a lot of people that I knew of Despair's Ray, but they were kind of interpreting it con- like literally, and it's supposed to be interpreted conceptually. <laughs> You know, people, I remember my friends hearing that song and being like, oh, this is not good. I'm not into this. And I'm like, dude, the whole point of the song, I mean, the song is called Fascism. It's a song about like a fascist regime. The band is not a fascist regime. Yeah. It's just a conceptual thing. Yes. Plus, you know, it's Visual K at this point. They were trying to be edgy. There seems to be kind of like a fascination with dictatorship in visual k in general yeah. yeah i was going to say i think it works just with this you know that the like the vocalist is sort of like the dictator of the audience kind of in a sense that you know mm-hmm. you, often the vocalists lead the footy like the dances that the audience do and such things so i mm-hmm. think that the imagery kind of makes sense from that regard that you know the vocalist is sort of like the dictator of the fans in a sense yeah plus uh what i've the the few research I've done on stuff like this, it seems like uh, it it a, a good way to attribute it is that Japan uh, after World War II um, buried a lot of stuff, and kids growing up learning about the war in school were told a much different story, and it was lightened and it was softened, and a lot of people grew up not really knowing what actually happened and what. Japan was responsible for and what Germany was responsible for in World War II. And so it, that might be part of it, you know? It's not seen as such an extreme thing, especially in the early 2000s. Maybe it's better now, but, you know, it's just like they just saw, like, Nazi flags and they thought, oh, this was, like, a really dominant force of war back in the day. We could use the imagery from that and just go ham and it, people see that and think we are, you know, powerful and all that stuff. And it's just music too. So it's like we could use that live to imply a sort of, like you said, like a dominant sort of dictative control over the audience. Well, you guys have some theories, but I'm firmly believing that this was actually an outtake from the historic media zone one recordings, uh, <laughs> just a boys in the back. The mics are left on. <laughs> no. it's, it's the dudes from Guillotine. I think they're the most sus. Yeah. True. I have to say, though, that the actual track itself, like the track Fascism, is one of their best of their early songs. It's yeah. just, a, oh, it's just yeah. a perfect, short, aggressive track. Like, And it has mm-hmm. one of the best representations of, you know, his, his, the angry, early, sort of like angry cat sounds those vocals that he was doing in those days i think this is the track i think yeah. of when someone mentions those vocals and it's also one of the few songs i think they consistently kept playing all the way until their disbandment it was like a super fan favorite during concerts did the guy still improv the first bit <laughs> no, <Or> no? <laughs> uh, they actually did a re-recording of this track le- 
about a year later, which was on a VA, which we will get to on the next episode. Okay, so they did realize that they kind of took an L for this one and were Uh, sort of trying to brush it under. (laughs) Yeah, the re-recording does not have uh, uh, this intro. They they did their studies afterwards. They were like, oh my god. Yeah. (laughs) We're just talking about making uh fangirls freak out and jump and go crazy i'm still waiting for the first band to be like because we always assume right that this is part of the visual k aesthetic like a lot of visual k bands have very kind of simple political commentary uh this is something that's been literally from the start to the end i'm just waiting for the first completely 100 percent ideological visual k band to show up and everyone just assumes that it's a rib but they're like no no we're serious <laughs> yeah i know yeah the closest things I can think of is like maybe like Mary for Modern Guard. They had a very Japanese nationalist, which is literally a song of theirs, uh, viewpoint. And they had for a while, but that was a different kind of nationalism. It was like traditionalism. Is it an aesthetic? No. N- not I'm aesthetic, not... but no? uh, lyrical. Like their songs, Gara wrote a lot of songs about sort of like a desire for things to return to a more classical Japan. Which doesn't make sense because their music is extremely westernized. Yeah, I like when bands have lyrics like that and they play like rock. <laughs> yeah. <and punk. laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, if they were serious, they would just, you know, and... sit and play the shamisen in some temple and mumble to themselves. <laughs> For real. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that was a sort of like a very, yeah, yeah Moving on from way me. off track. So, about the Terrors EP, yeah. I think this is sort of like a major development sound wise from their previous efforts i feel like they're mm-hmm. diversifying their sound here and sort of becoming more comfortable yeah. with their style uh, i feel like they develop mm-hmm. more of an own identity with this ep my favorite tracks are probably carnival and murder freaks murder freaks is like the perfect sort of despa song catchy heavy dark edgy it was like the first song of theirs that i was sending around to my friends and converting people to the cause. <laughs> Could they which cause? The... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sorry, which cause? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, no, but it, that's such a bad song to send to people, though. Like, the, there's a one-minute spoken word intro. <laughs> it's great. It <laughs> yeah, really like, sets yeah. up the corniness of it. Uh, yeah, but it's just, I don't know. I, I wouldn't send that to someone like, here, check out this band. And then they just hear this, like, doom, doom, like, does doom it get piano. Than and this? then it's just his yeah. misspeaking. I think it's because a lot of these people were into Malice Miser, And a lot of Malice Miser stuff had that kind of, like, slow brooding feel. That track was on Shock Edge. 2002 the omnibus so clearly the band thought it was a good like yeah they loved it oh yeah I mean, it's a fun favorite it's a fun favorite it was in rotation until the end as well usually for fan club concerts they always brought this one out uh but the thing is that at least for me i think i've over listened it because i don't know I do, it doesn't really do it for me anymore when i listen to it now <laughs> i feel from this album i think my favorites at the moment at least are fascism uh, carnival and setsubo romance which i think is yeah. one of the most underrated despair ray songs it's, it's it's really good i think setsubo romance is their most dark and gloomy song of all i think yeah. it might be their yeah and it develops it's very, very nicely yeah it's very setsubo exactly yeah i'm gonna jump on the setsubo romance train as well um and i also made the same note that murder freaks didn't do it for me as much as i remember doing when i was a kid um actually i would add fascism to that as well but then the middle part of the album surprised me positively although erode probably isn't their greatest moment um <laughs> I, f- I find it funny though that in, in addition to being a darren gray song title it kind of does have that fucking hoppity scotch rhythm <laughs> of erode <laughs> from missa <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Deering Gray reference. Nice. Oh, yeah. We had to get uh, it in, right? Yeah, for sure. That song feels definitely old. Like, it feels like it's a much yeah. older song. It could have been one of their demos, for sure. Oh, it definitely yeah. doesn't. Because this album is pitch black. It's like a morass. And it's yeah. uh, this is when they really... I would actually say that it's the darkest release overall out of everything. As a whole. Yeah. Um, it's just that song that sort of bra- lightens the mood a little bit, if you can even call it that. Yeah, I mean, my notes for Erode is just Bokuga, 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 Bokuga. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the intro bokuga, for the song. Bokuga, 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 Bokuga. Yeah, with some, with some echo. 
But yeah, I think it's uh, to add to this though, uh, is that during their One Man Light to celebrate the release of this album, uh, the live was called Six Terrors, uh, and the album has only five songs. So you might wonder, what is the Sixth Terror? Well, it's a song that was live distributed at this concert, which is called Monokuro Ninata Saigo no Hi. Uh, which is uh, an absolutely amazing long atmospheric ballad, which I think deserves mention, even though it only got a proper CD release uh, at the very end of their career on a best of album. I think it's even on Spotify, so people can easily find it. I was hoping that the sixth terror would be you, the fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it might be. I think it's open to interpretation, but I okay, mean, good. since the song was handed out at a one man live called Six Terror, it makes sense if it's the six track, the one they handed out at the show. Uh, that's my take at least. Oh, you know how every fucking band now has this kind of corny name for their fans? <laughs> yes. Are the Desperate Ray fans called Terrors? No, uh, they have lost opportunity. That's how you can tell that this was a long time ago. Because if it happened today, that would one hundred and ten percent. I think their fan club was called Unbeautiful. That's sad. That's kind of rude. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, my little unbeautifuls. <laughs> my little ugly. Something was flattering. Fan club name. No. <laughs> Although I gotta say about the song, it's my favorite dispersed ray track overall. Nice Monokuro. Mm-hmm. It's a good one. Yeah, it's one of mine as well. It's just amazing. The atmosphere is probably unbeatable in their discography, and it's a shame it had such a sort of like obscure place in their discography. Yeah, wasn't the whole this this whole release was like part of it was supposed to be the reverse side of Despair's Ray? I was looking at the cover art and it said the reverse side. Oh, that's like, almost uh, like an that's, alter ego thingy. Uh, that's Ura Mania Theater. That oh, right, was a right, right. uh, fan club demo tape that was released right. a couple of months after. This song was actually handed out on a CD at the concert in 2001 first, and then gotcha. it was included on this fan club uh, cassette as well. With Valentine. Right, exactly. Yeah. But Valentine is included on the final release we're discussing in this episode, so I think we will just yeah, we'll uh, take. Yeah, I think we'll take it with that one. So, um, the final release we're doing today is uh, their Sexual Beast EP, which was released in June 2002, so uh, almost a year after Terrors, actually, which was from July 2001. But first, a message from our sponsors. This episode of the Visual K Podcast is sponsored by Rare's Hut, your source for rare and not-so-rare imported Japanese rock, metal, and Visual K outside of Japan. Their prices compete with street prices in Japan, so save on import fees and shop at Rare's Hut. Wow, look at all these rares! This week, from September 13th through the 20th, Rare's Hut is holding a lottery contest to celebrate a thousand followers on Facebook, where one random order will be totally free. The order will be picked at random at the end of the period, and the order total will be refunded. Uh, guys, is it is it possible to have too many rares? <laughs> no. And if you're a new customer, you can enter the code VKPC at checkout and get 10% off your first order. Unless you win the contest, and then it's 100% off! And we're back. And welcome to the VKPC Poetry Grand Slam. This is Mixmaster Alexi, and the first one to take the stage, <clears throat> Aaron, take it away. <laughs> Are we doing this? Yes. <laughs> Where's the lyrics? Oh my god, I don't think we have time for this. Ten minutes? We have ten minutes! Yeah, yeah, but it, I mean, just very quickly. <laughs> Where's the lyrics? They should be somewhere. Here. Are you guys reading the lyrics for real? I mean, just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. There was nothing but the sand, as far as the eyes could see. I am nearly dying of thirst. 
That's how it goes. <laughs> Struggles. <laughs> I can't screen the part at the end. Fuck it. Let's just go. Let's roll it. I, I gotta do it. I'm dying. <laughs> That's, you, wanna, uh... you wanna do the whole thing? <laughs> no, do it. You started it. <laughs> I'm nearly dying of thirst always. <laughs> always cureless of the dry and pain. I asked uh, you yes. for the sleeping. <laughs> Another mask into your mind. Uh. <laughs> Struggle to get from the chain. Now you. She intensely whips my body. <laughs> but I undid all the pain in silence. That's good. That's beautiful. You. Great. Thank you. Let's, uh, Thank you. Thank so you. let's cut all of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that deserved an hour long so, laugh track. Uh, yes. So I actually want to. Uh, <laughs> so actually, I thought that Aaron could start with this one since he mentioned that Sexual Beast yeah. was the first release he heard. So it what is. do you think about the actual album beyond the lyrics of Gothic, which you guys just recited beautifully? <laughs> yeah, other than the horrendous English of Gothic, the track, the first track with Hizumi reciting a poem in monotone like a, like a Gregorian chanter. Um, this, this CD is great. Um, it was my first exposure to this band. Um, Kuma was my second, but with this CD, I, it was the band sound was like perfectly formed by this point, and it was just excellent. And not a single track of this release um, I skip. It's great. I'd say Valentine is like my second favorite song after Kise Parasite. I love it. It's catchy, memorable, beautiful. What yeah, do you I have to say that I never got gothic as a child i thought it was too weird this like <laughs> sliding bass sort of like very slow and the monotone speaking voice and i don't know it just didn't really do it for me at plus first, it's the same but, thing over and over and over yeah like... yeah but the second track though that's where it really hit it for me i would say that the second track which is tatueba kimi ga shindara is uh one of my all-time favorite Disperse yeah. Ray tracks, and it might even be my favorite Disperse Ray track. Nice. Just because it uh, has the most sort of like childhood memories and nostalgia for me. Uh, I remember the first time I saw Disperse Ray live in 2009, I was really hoping I would get to see this one because I had friends who went to see them in Copenhagen in Denmark, that was a thing, in 2006. And apparently they played this as well as several other really old songs, but in 2009 it was already too late for that, so I didn't get to see it and I was kind of bummed out about it. Uh, yeah, it's it's great. I Tatooaba is fantastic and I love the part where he's like, FREEDOM! I want a freedom. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I want a freedom, but it sounds so cool when he says it. He wants a freedom. He, I want a freedom, bro. God, it shouldn't come I'm in between the man and his freedom. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you want a freedom. He's just a, you know, a very staunch libertarian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> He's letting people know that fascism was not him. In fact, he want a freedom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Actually, you know what? This is exactly. <laughs> Getting back to that issue. Yeah. And he won a freedom for all of us. Oh. <laughs> See, uh, That's why he's an yeah. icon. I think track three <laughs> is the most anonymous one out mm -hmm. of these three, but four, but it's definitely not a bad track. It's just yeah. sort of like falls into this sort of like decent disperse race song, but nothing special to me. Not talking about Valentine? Uh, no, no Furachina. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's definitely the weakest four. track, but it's 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 it fits especially because if you're just enjoying the rest of the CD, you kind of just want the w the one gripe I have with the band from this period is a technicality actually, and it's this release because the band themselves label this as an EP or a mini album. Hmm. It has four songs and it clocks in at sixteen and a half minutes. I think it's very mm. generous to call this a mini album. Yeah. And it may, what makes it even weirder is that the following year they released what is officially a single called Maverick, which is 
18 minutes long, so it's <laughs> two minutes longer, and that's a single. But this one is somehow an EP. I do well, not you bring understand. bring balance to the universe. <laughs> yeah, he's bouncing out. Format is just a state of mind. It's like, do, what do you feel like this is? Oh man, this feels like an, a mini album for me for sure. To me, it feels like I never thought of it as short. I th this is when the band learns to make hits. And when I say hits, this is something that they would do. Like anything before this is not really a hit. It's nothing that yeah, you could ever imagine like kind of being played hits. on the radio. Not that these are radio songs per se, but there is catchy choruses already. And it doesn't right. just stop there. I really love the texture. It's kind of lo-fi, but at the same time, it isn't. But it has this very rough and raw effect throughout a lot of guitar screeching. And also deceptively not VK at all, while simultaneously being kind of very VK. This is a Despise Ray sounding release. Were they on Sword Records by this point or Speed Disc? What, what the heck were they on? I'm trying to figure out like what production company. <laughs> yeah. I what? mean, other than <laughs> drugs and booze, what were they on? <laughs> uh, speed disc. Uh, speed disc, speed according disc. to okay. uh, VK. What are they on? Speed disc. <laughs> speed disc. <laughs> Discs of speed. Yes, exactly. That uh, sounds like it. Yes. That's all I have to say about Sexual Beast, though, despite it being a great release. Yeah. Um, and that, and it was their last chance to re record Razor and Sakura without having to uh, re totally rearrange them, and they blew it. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I agree. I think this uh, uh, this mini-album is a good place to end the first episode, because I feel like this is sort of like the book end to their very earliest period, because the next release, only a couple of months after this, is Ori no Naka de Miroyume, and I feel like already then the sound has shifted quite a bit. Yep. So I think it makes sense for us to end the episode on the very earliest part of the, I almost said yeah. Gazette, uh, the earliest part of uh, <laughs> the Disperse Ray discography here. Well, we're, we're ending on a high note, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's my favorite release from the band in general. Yes. Uh, nice. I mean, I actually own both pressings of this mini album. That's much how much I like it. I ha needed to have it twice. Gotta have it twice, yeah. <laughs> The I cover own arts all the are... copies of Hysteric Media Zone 1. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Hysteric yeah. Media Zone's kind of expensive, too. I've been looking for the earlier ones on, yeah. on auction. Hard to find. The second pressing of uh, Sexual Beast has a decapitated head on a plate as the cover art. I think. Oh, that's, yeah, the you know... cover is sick, too. It's totally in line with yeah. the aesthetic of the sound. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool. It's great. Yeah, so I think with that we have sort of covered everything from the very earliest period of uh, of this first ray. Do you guys have anything to add to as a final sort of summary for how you feel about this era in general before we wrap up? Love it. Um, I never get sick of it. I can listen to this era of this band a million times and always come back to it. But that's just, it could be nostalgia. It's also <laughs> just good shit. Yeah, I would recommend all newer VK fans to go back and give this band a chance because I feel like they could definitely vibe with a lot of this content. Agreed. When I got into the band, if it was during the call set era, uh, I was obviously completely smitten with it, but I've sort of turned around on it as the years gone by, but this era still holds up to me and it's uh, it has become my favorite from the band. And I would recommend it to anyone who doesn't mind the industrial metal sounds and this kind of dark vk context it certainly ages uh, the best out of their their stuff oh for sure and a lot of their stuff doesn't age super well because it's it was good at the time but then it, it's really simple they kind of simplified and simplified all the way to the very end I, I would say that the alternative metal and alternative rock style of later years has definitely experienced a crash in yeah. market price compared to this yeah. very sort of obscure raw yeah ripped from tape sound of early dispersion mm -hmm. right yeah for sure i agree so uh just finally james what's your impression of dispersed way now that you've heard like it's a couple of short snippets yeah i don't know <laughs> uh there's definitely guitar in it <laughs> and with uh, that ringing endorsement i guess uh, all that is left <laughs> is to uh, thank everyone for listening and as usual there was nothing but the sand <laughs> As far as the eye could see, I am nearly dying of thirst always, always cureless of the dry and pain. 
I asked you for the sleeping. Another mask into your mind. Struggle to get from the chain. She intends to with my body. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Let's cut that. But I endured the pain in silence. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to help us out, please subscribe. Give us a like or a five-star rating on whatever platform you're listening to us on, be it YouTube or Spotify, Apple Music, whatever your poison is. Recommend us to your friends. It really helps us out. It uh, you know motivates us to do more and to do better. And it can only get better from here. You can follow us on Twitter at the VK Podcast. You can also join us on the VKG Discord server. We have a channel on there. Come hang out with us and uh, talk about VK. Talk about about the the show meet new vk fans it's a great server overall uh catch new episodes on apple podcasts spotify youtube and pretty much anywhere else you can listen to podcasts thanks again